All right there, everyone, strap yourselves in. Studies show that right-wing conservatives are far more sexually satisfied than left-wing liberals. That's to be talking about on today's video. But first, just a few more days for you to get my book, The Abolition of Sanity, free as an ebook download at the link below. If you want to be able to explain in just a very rational and dialogical manner to others why it is that we as conservatives are so opposed to the modernist globalist project of the EU and other organizations dedicated to a one-size-fits-all political and economic approach to life, well, then this book is going to provide for you the single most powerful arguments imaginable. It's absolutely free for a limited time as my gift to you. I only ask that you please leave a review on the Amazon book page. It will help so much with Amazon's promotion of the book. We can get it into this many hands as possible, and I can't thank you enough for that. All right, you know, um, several weeks back, we did a video and a number of studies that show that conservatives are disproportionately happier than liberals, right? Even the ultra-liberal New York Times recognized this. They found that 52% of married, religious, politically conservative people who have children are found to be very, very happy. But when it comes to single, secular liberal people without kids, well, that happiness drops to an astonishing 14%. So conservatives are clearly happier than liberals. Well, now we may know the real reason for that happiness. According to several studies, conservative right-wingers are consistently more happy with their sex lives than leftist liberals. The most recent study was conducted by YouGov, which surveyed 19,000 people in the UK, France, Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. And what they found is that those who identify as right-wing and conservatives are more likely to be happier with their sex lives than those who identified as left-wing liberal. In fact, actually, it gets even more interesting here. The more right-wing you are, the more sexually satisfied you tend to be. 71% of Europeans who identified as being, quote, very right-wing say they are sexually satisfied compared with barely 60% of those who identify as being very left-wing. Now, this seems to confirm earlier studies that show Republicans consistently more satisfied with their sex lives than Democrats. And interestingly enough, a University of Chicago study found that women who had a conservative religious affiliation were more sexually satisfied than women who were irreligious. In fact, there's quite a number of studies that confirm this mutual satisfaction for conservative men and women. Nearly 90% of people who've been married to only one person their whole lives report a very healthy sex life. And 84% of people who attend church regularly gave their partner high marks compared to those who rarely attend church, who in turn rated their sex lives the worst in the survey. What's going on here, right? Conservatives are happier. They're more sexually satisfied. They're actually even more handsome. We'll get to that in another video. How do we account for this? Well, again, the studies do seem to offer some insight here. Generally speaking, conservatives tend to have the sense that there's a natural order to life and the world as a whole. And that order is good and it's right. Conservatives tend to see the world as created with a divine meaning and purpose and thus seek intentionally to conform their lives into harmonious relationship with that divine meaning and purpose. And that commitment, that intentional ordering of our lives to a, to a divinely ordained fixed order that gives, it's that which gives people a sense of meaning and purpose in their life. This is why conservatives are so committed to the protection and perpetuation of their cultures, customs, and traditions, because it's through culture and the constituents of culture, like our literature and our art and architecture and music and poetry, that we encounter precisely that divine order, that divine meaning and purpose that calls us to align our lives with the truth, goodness, and beauty that's eternal and that transcends the inevitable difficulties and pains and adversities that we all experience in life, without which life easily collapses into a cynical and flippant nihilistic meaninglessness. And this is most especially true for sex, sex and sexuality. 
Sex and sexuality historically in the West are inextricably linked to an absolutely beautiful vision of cosmic order. Many people don't actually know the specifics of this. If they're conservative, they just often simply live this out intuitively. But in Christian civilization, either in the Greek East or the Latin West, the basic frame of reference that constitutes a distinctively Christian vision of marriage and sexuality is the image of the coming of the kingdom of God in a wedding feast. In John's gospel in particular, this future vision is portrayed beautifully in the marriage feast at Cana where Christ turned water into wine. I don't know if you're familiar with Alexander Pope's beautiful description of that miracle, but he wrote, the conscious water saw its master and blushed. Isn't that beautiful? And of course, turning water into wine is in contrast to the cursings of Egypt where the water was turned into blood. Water is the basic element of creation, and it's now turned into a symbol of communion. And this communion between man and woman is ultimately emblematic of the renewed communion between heaven and earth and God and man re realized in the transformative life, death, and resurrection of Christ, who, of course, is fully God and fully man in the Christian confession. Thus, the miracle at Cana is but a foretaste of the cosmic marriage between heaven and earth yet to come. And what's really neat is if you read the text in John chapter 2, you'll notice that John begins the narrative of the wedding at Cana by placing it on the third day, which of course is, this is the very first verse of the chapter, and of course the third day is the day of resurrection, and thus the culmination of the whole of biblical history from creation to communion, from garden to city, from water to wine. And so from the very beginning of the church, the Apostle Paul sees the man and woman embodying the two archetypes of this redemptive cosmic order. The man represents Christ and the woman represents the church with their union embodying the cosmic union of heaven and earth. And thus, patristic scholars like John Meyendorf have observed that this vision of marriage was the guiding principle throughout Byzantine and Latin civilization. And what we're finding is that the sanctity of this vision contributes inordinately to health and happy marriages and sex lives. You know, I have to tell you, one of my favorite experts on sexuality is none other than Sister Wendy. Are you, are you familiar with Sister Wendy? She became famous as an art critic through a series of BBC art documentaries in the 1990s. Now, of course, Sister Wendy was a consecrated virgin. And yet, whenever she analyzed a work of art that expressed sensuality and, and, and the, a sacred vision of sexuality, she expressed it in the most beautiful way. I mean, no one, no one could describe it and explain it more magnificently and more faithfully than Sister Wendy, than a consecrated nun who willingly took God's gift of sex and sexuality and gave it back to him as a symbol of sacrificial love. This nun understood what she was giving up, and she adored and cherished that sacrifice, far better than any licentious left-wing liberal ever could. Therein, I think, lies a key ingredient as to why conservatives are so happy and so satisfied sexually. It's because anything that we treat and protect as sacred awakens a love and a delight that a desecrated and flippant and cynical life simply never could experience. By protecting sex as sacred, we end up experiencing its greatest joys and delights. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. Check out some of our awesome merchandise in the link below. Get yourself, a, for example, some awesome God Emperor Trump coffee mugs and t-shirts that you're going to love. Please click on either our Patreon subscribes to our PayPal links below. Become a supporter of this channel and help us to continue to analyze current events in light of awesome and amazing conservative trends so that you can personally and professionally flourish. God bless. All right, everyone, CNN experiences one of its worst ratings disasters as its viewers decline by double digits in a single week. That's what we're talking about. 
On today's video, John Nolte over at Breitbart has a great piece detailing how the already humiliating ratings of CNN actually took another nosedive by double digits just last week, which seems to have prompted the ratings plunge with CNN's 24-7 coverage of the mass murder in New Zealand, which involves shamelessly, shamelessly trying to pin President Trump to the murders. Throughout the week, CNN questioned Trump's mental health, his patriotism. They accused him of serial lying. Again, Nolte points out this unhinged hate campaign obviously turned off a considerable number of Americans. When compared to the same week last year, CNN lost a total 16% on its primetime viewers and 17% in its daytime viewers. But the real hit they took was with young people. In the advertiser coveted 25 to 54 age demo, CNN lost an incredible 31% of its viewers during their primetime, 29% total for their daytime lineup. Now, when you compare CNN to Fox News, we find some pretty interesting stats. Not only does Fox News triple CNN in primetime viewers and more than double CNN in total daytime viewers, but during that same week when CNN hemorrhaged audience members, Fox held almost perfectly steady, with actually a 1% increase in primetime viewers and a 1% decrease in total daytime viewers. And as far as the ultra-left MSNBC is concerned, uh, they held their losses more or less to single digits during the same week as CNN plummeted. When all is said and done, in all cable TV during primetime, Fox News hit number one, MSNBC number three, uh, ESPN is number two, and CNN bottomed out at 11. When it comes to their individual shows, things get even worse for CNN. While 12 different shows on Fox News all appear in the top 20 rankings for cable news shows, and the other eight go to MSNBC, when it comes to CNN, not a single one of their news shows, not one, registers in the top 20 cable news programs. Not one. Their closest, their most popular program is Chris Cuomo's Primetime Hour, which ranks a humiliating 23rd place with barely, just barely over a million total viewers. And Anderson Cooper's show comes in at 24th. Every single show that Fox News has, whether it's Hannity, Tucker, Laura Ingram, Fox and Friends, whatever, every single Fox News show tops every single CNN show. Fox indeed has three of the top four shows on cable news. I think it's rather plain as to why people are turning off CNN. And it's because it's emphatically not a news network. They're a propaganda machine. They don't report news. They report left-wing liberal globalism. That's key, I think, to understanding why CNN is faltering here. They don't report news. They report globalism. They're defenders and hysterical apologists for secular liberal globalism. And they seek to defame and malign and impugn any and all perceived threats to the liberal globalist order. This is why Trump and Putin are enemies numbers one and two. They're quite rightly, by the way, perceived as enemies of the secular liberal globalist order that CNN celebrates and defends. All perceived threats to the health and well-being of secular liberal globalism are portrayed by CNN as evil and criminal and ignorant and bigoted and homophobic and racist and xenophobic. And of course, every single proponent of secular liberal globalism is portrayed as rational and sensible and hip and funny and cool. And some even get messianic status like Barack Obama for eight years. That is CNN in a nutshell. Perhaps you don't remember, but I'll be happy to remind you. When the whole Stormy Daniels situation blew up, again, largely at the hands of the corporatist media, one report cited a stat that CNN had Stormy Daniels' lawyer, you know, the guy who's since been widely referred to as the creepy porn lawyer, Michael Avenatti. You know, the same Michael Avenatti that claimed he had what he called significant evidence that Judge Brett Kavanaugh was involved in drugging and gang raping girls during high school. Yeah, that Michael Avenatti, who's since been ordered to pay President Trump's legal bills in an utterly humiliating verdict for him. But regardless, CNN doesn't want you to remember this, but I'll be happy to remind you. When the whole Stormy Daniels fiasco broke out a few months back, CNN had Avenatti on their programs more than 
five dozen times in a matter literally of days. Five freaking dozen times. Who on earth could possibly believe that this is a news organization? No, you know, the Food Network gets higher ratings than CNN. I mean, it's nothing more than a massive left-wing globalist propaganda machine and shouldn't be taken seriously, at least especially given its hysterics. And the good news is that the number of viewers who take them seriously is dwindling ever more by the day. And to make matters even worse for CNN, remember, they're currently being sued for over a quarter of a billion dollars in damages by Nick Sandman, you know, the young man who's at the center of the whole Covenant Catholic School controversy at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. CNN is being sued in, in uh, Castleman, uh, Nick's lawyer's terms for their vicious coverage of Nick and his supposed racist and privileged posture standing in front of the Native American fellow who was actually harassing him. CNN is so bad in all of this, just to give you an idea of how left-wing ideology so dominates their mediation of events, there's, they still have a tweet up, an official CNN tweet that's still up on Twitter blaming Salmon and his classmates for racism and taunting a Native American elder. Fox News couldn't help but point out that this tweet is under CNN's banner, hashtag facts first. And then to make matters even worse, the tweet links to a story on CNN's website that claims it's been updated several times that continues to represent the students as deliberately mocking the Native American fellow, even though they've been completely exonerated from any wrongdoing in the matter. You had CNN commentators actually coming out and saying that Nick Sandman, this young teenager, was deplorable. They actually used the basket of deplorables terminology. One in particular said he was deplorable and should be punched in the face. This is but one of numerous examples for why Nick Sandman's lawyers are suing CNN for its vicious slander of Nick and the students. And so things just keep getting worse and worse for CNN. And it, you know, it couldn't happen, happen to a nicer left-wing globalist propaganda machine. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. Click on either our Patreon, subscribe star, or PayPal links below. Become a supporter of this channel. And help us to continue to analyze current events in light of awesome conservative trends so that you can personally and professionally flourish. God bless. Hey there, everyone. You know, I remember well the late night television that I grew up with. One of my uh, rites of passage, as it were, uh, into young adulthood was staying up late at night watching The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And, you know, I can remember being introduced to all kinds of fascinating figures in the world of music and entertainment. I actually discovered uh, the classical guitarist John Williams on The Tonight Show. I can still remember him performing the piece Asturias by the uh, Spanish composer Isaac Albanese. Um, I remember performances by Yo-Yo Ma, the great cellist, or the violin virtuoso Itzhak Perlman. I remember rolling in laughter with the king of comedy Don Rickles in his interviews with Johnny Carson, right? Mr. Warmth. Um, Carson had old hangovers from vaudeville, like the clumsy clown acrobat George Carl. It was absolutely brilliant in terms of his display of physical comedy. Well, now, unfortunately, that world of real, edifying, and delightful late-night entertainment is dead. And what it's been replaced with is a bunch of sanctimonious virtue signaling from self-appointed leaders of the anti-Trump resistance. Now, when you turn on late-night television, you watch Stephen Colbert give F-bomb-laced rants about President Trump performing oral sex on Vladimir Putin. And you'll see Jimmy Kimmel lecture us all week long about everything from health care to mental health to gun control. In fact, the latest from Kimmel, I don't know if you heard from Jimmy Kimmel, is that he likened a recent court ruling in favor of a Christian baker not being forced to participate in a same-sex wedding ceremony. He likened that to refusing to serve Jewish people. What Kimmel was referring to is that a California judge, if you can believe it, okay, yes, there are still sane California judges out there. A California judge held that a Christian baker, Kathy Miller, has a First Amendment right not 
to create a wedding cake for same-sex ceremony. The case was brilliantly argued, in my opinion, in that Miller's defense was that she had no interest in discriminating against homosexuals. She'd be happy to serve anyone who came into her store. What she refused to do was participate in something. She had no interest in using her skills to participate in a wedding, and they argued she had every constitutional right not to participate, and they won. Well, in the liberal la-la land of Jimmy Kimmel, that's a no-no. You're, you're not allowed to descend in any way, shape, or form for when it comes to this LGBT fascism fad. And so he callously likened this refusal to participate in a homosexual wedding to anti-Semitic refusals to serve Jewish people. How, how funny, Jimmy. How creative. How entertaining. What, what a unique insight on your part, Jimmy. Now, if you happened to miss this, from late night television, well, you're not alone. The fact is, is that, well, nobody is really watching late night television anymore. Uh, ben Dominic over at The Federalist points out that the late night viewership of ABC, CBS, and NBC combined is barely breaking 8 million viewers total. Just to, just to give you a sense of how far things have plummeted for late night uh, television not so long ago. Jay Leno, who replaced Johnny Carson, he was bringing in 6 million viewers a night, all on his own. Johnny Carson was raking in about uh, 9 million viewers. He got nearly 20 million viewers watching his final week's uh, show. Now, today, the combination of all three networks is barely bringing in what Jay Leno could do on his own. Now, of course, there were a number of factors to this. Uh, mass decline in audience viewership, such as the advent of YouTube, right? People can watch what they want, when they want, how they want. But many believe there's something much more going on here because we're seeing similar ratings plummets, plummeting with the NFL this year, as well as the Emmy Awards show, even the current Winter Olympics coverage is an all-time low. There seems to be a one-to-one -one correlation between the politicalization of entertainment and a drop in audience viewership, right? So we saw this, of course, with the national anthem protests in the NFL, where even direct TV had to issue refunds for viewers who boycotted the season as an expression of their outrage over their sports games becoming political commentary and horrible, pathetic commentary at that. But this doesn't seem to be bothering the late night industry in the least. When, uh, when Jimmy Kimmel was asked whether he was worried about losing Republican viewers. He basically said, I don't care, good riddance. I, actually, actually, he said, rather than saying good riddance, I would just say riddance, uh, which again is so unclever. <laughs> it's, it's just so intellectually lazy. But what Kimmel is getting at here is that he and his producers recognize that when he says anything again, anything inflammatory against Trump, his ratings go up. Same with Colbert. And so the business model that the producers of these late show programs are pushing is one that goes after niche markets, particularly political niche markets. And that appears to be what Colbert and Kim will have over Jimmy Fallon over at The Tonight Show, who stayed away from political niche markets. And as a result, he's seen his ratings decline. And so what Colbert and Kimmel are trying to do is become the late night kings of this very diminishing and dwindling market share. Now, there are two things I think we can glean from uh, all of this. First, we have to understand that historically comedy was a means of cultural critique. If we go back, say, to ancient Greece, we find that Comedy sought to address the political and social issues of their day with whimsical critique and satire. The neat thing about classical comedy is the keen insight that it gave to society. So, for example, Aristophanes, Aristophanes Lysistrata, it's a, it was a, a Greek play on ancient Greek notions of women being sexually undisciplined. And so... The women during the whole Peloponnesian conflict to get the men to stop fighting go on a sex strike. And as it turns out, that it's the men who actually go crazy with their unbridled passions. So you see, classical comedy 
employed irony and satire to make profound social commentary. And this is developed in Christianity as well. Uh, saint Philip Neri was actually called the humorous saint, and he used self-deprecating humor as a way to express humility. Uh, Anthony Eslin reminds us laughter is one of the key motifs of our heavenly and redemptive hope. Now, if we take a step back here, then we'll notice that what we what we find funny actually says a lot about who we are as people. Our comedians, in many respects, reveal our worldviews. I remember saying a joke uh, to a class that was not particularly complimentary of women, and the feminists in my classroom were just livid. They were hardly amused. Uh, they were frankly offended by it. Well, humor reveals that. It reveals what's normative and acceptable in a society, or the opposite. What's what's, uh, you know, non-normative and so forth. Uh, it gives us, uh, I think, a window, therefore, into what's going on in late-night television. Um, these guys are not posturing to convert anybody. They're speaking to the already converted. As Rich Lowry over the New York Post comments, Stephen Colbert, isn't, he's not trying to convince anyone. He's scorning and mocking Trump for the benefit of people who already hate him. And as a result, the quality of comedy and richness of cultural critique just begin to disappear. Again, Lowry noted that, you know, agiprop is in political propaganda, just it's not that funny. And so these comedians lower themselves to the kind of shock comedy that was found in the likes of Howard Stern and others, where cultural critique takes basically a backseat to fulfilling linguistic and conceptual lusts. So gone are the insightful critiques of culture, and in their place, you have a kind of, you know, just this lewd, pornified humor. Uh, through, through the shock comedian, I get to experience perverse and lewd language and concepts that excite me precisely because these are not supposed to be said and done in public. It's basically the pornification of comedy. And then I extend that pornification to political figures and paradigms that my audience hates, and voila, I'm... I'm, I'm at the top of the ratings. Forget the fact that those ratings represent an ever-dwindling portion of the market share. Who cares? Works for Kimmel. Works for Colbert. Who cares? The second thing I think we need to recognize is that this decline in ratings seems to me to be just another indicator that the world really is just turning away from this stuff, from these kind of secular, corporatist, globalist celebrations. We're increasingly... Well, frankly, we're bored with the virtue signaling, and we're not particularly attracted to the vulgar and lewd laced rants that substitute for classical comedy. It's just not very funny anymore. It's not entertaining. So people are watching their choice of, well, Netflix series or Fox's late night lineup of Seinfeld or 30 Rock episodes. They're just not interested in turning into the cultural equivalent of the losers from the Democratic National Committee. So all in all, I think the demise of late night television is just another cultural indicator of the cultural rot that is the secular liberalism that so pervades our elitist institutions. The globalist vision of life is indeed dying. And unfortunately, watching them rot and wither on late night television is anything but funny. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure to get alerted each time I post a new video where we analyze current events in light of conservative trends so that you can personally and professionally flourish. God bless. I have no problem with political polarization if its net effect is that of truth. Yeah. What's, what's virtuous about being moderate in the face of someone's life being turned to ruins by lies? You don't get to lie and then defame the person fighting that lie right. for polarizing America. The top five leftist hoaxes of 2019. Uh, so question of the day, let me ask you this. Genuinely, how do you vet news stories today? If you read or hear something interesting, w what do you do to determine the veracity? I'm, I'm really curious, let me know, because it is getting pretty difficult. So very. Obviously, I believe yeah. that the left is wrong. And listen, why do you say right or left? Shut up. I believe they're <laughs> mainly wrong about everything. But just, that means wrong, not dishonest. Right. But we have seen a new threat emerging in 2019. In the past, 
they would usually bolster their claims, the progressive left, with, with evidence that maybe we didn't think supported. We would disagree right. uh, on the idea that it supported their conclusions. Mm -hmm. But now there is a movement, and when I say this, I mean Hollywood, media, and, and those in the DNC. So I know someone out there like, I'm a classical liberal. I get it. Not talking about you, right. Ruben. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, Ruben. But they've pivoted to completely nice. false evidence, hoaxes to support the majority, wow. certainly a plurality of their political agenda. So we're going to look at the top five verifiable hoaxes perpetrated by the left in 2019. And we're not even at summer break yet. No, no, <laughs> Keep in mind. No. They packed them in. The MTV VJs <laughs> just packed up their tarp from Cancun, <laughs> and we already have five to go through. So you know you uh, number five, Kavanaugh rape hoax, obviously, oh is a pretty big yeah. one. A lot of people are saying, wasn't that 2018? No, it happened this year. Whoa. That's how no. slowly yeah. it's going by. So, so after the investigations, they show, showed us that Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, um, didn't have any kind of a record. Suddenly, no. Democrats, they trotted out lines of women claiming that he not only assaulted them sexually, but he rang, uh, he, he would run gape, gape, <laughs> gang, gang, wait, rape ooh. gang rings. There's no rape way that word is going rings, to sound. I made yeah. it sound. How can you make rape gang rings sound worse? I just did. Yeah. <laughs> gape, rape, <laughs> gang, <laughs> gape, no, rings, purpose. something. And they did it right before the vote. So like, Lest you think I'm exaggerating, because a lot of people forget, here you go. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter. She's a doctor. This third by the accuser, way. her name is <laughs> Julie Swetnick, publicly identified herself and alleged that Kavanaugh and others in the early 1980s others. spiked the drinks of girls at high school parties with intoxicants to make it easier for them to be gang raped. Okay. So, oh, oh it must gay, be true. Gang, gay, 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 rape, gag, rings, gang rings. It's very Something. difficult to say. Ooh, say it five yes. times fast. If you do, They'll make sure that you never make Supreme Court. So <laughs> Blasey Ford, her accusations, by the way, completely fell apart. Before we get yeah. to the, the gang rape, uh, she couldn't determine the place where the alleged assault happened. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the people she remembered being there, they denied the event ever having taken place. <laughs> yeah. She Oops. couldn't remember the year it happened, and outside That's counsel important. concluded that there was no, there would be no reasonable prosecutor who would bring criminal charges against the judge. Uh, her story kept changing, and as time went case. on, by the way, her therapist, <laughs> the notes from her therapist presented a completely different account than the one that she gave in her hearing. That Julie Swetnick oh, she just mentioned uh, made the gang rape, accusa gang rape accusations. I cannot say that it, word. It's, it's <laughs> impossible. Anyway, the bottom line is, after mulling it over, understanding yes. potential the threat of yeah. perjury, she walked it back a little bit. Really, what you say he was a gang rapist? It's no. about optics. <laughs> Wait, what? What's, what optics are what optics are bad here? Namely, that I lied about gang rape. <laughs> Those ones. I'm In the sorry. war of PR, lying about gang rape. By the oh, the third accuser admitted. By the way, she'd never even met Kavanaugh. That was one too. So there are three main. Those are the three Come main on, accusers. At least be in the same room with a guy one time and in your life. This is the highest level of hoax. It's yeah. a coordinated effort by Democrat activists to push a completely false story in order to prevent yeah. the Supreme Court nomination. And of course, the left, they didn't accept the results when their hoax fell to pieces. Right. They still smear him as a rapist. And by the way, I'm not in the business of ascribing uh, motive or intent here, but honestly, uh. let me ask you this. What, is it, what does it take? Yeah. Two out of three were verifiably completely false. They pulled it back themselves with the only one remaining presenting zero evidence absent yeah. the cases where she presented verifiably false evidence. Uh, what does it take to just admit you were wrong? What does it take to just allow for innocent until proven guilty? Number four uh, hoax, we have to rattle off this. There are so many here. Uh, of course, the Russian collusion conspiracy theory. Uh, now, I know this technically, deal. of course, it started years ago. Uh, uh, came to yes. a head in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Democrats refused to accept the, uh, the results of our democratic election. Of course. Which, of course, shouldn't that should send shivers down your yeah. spine when you're talking about democ democratic socialism. <laughs> well, you don't even believe in the first part, which you're using to try to make the second part sound less <laughs> You don't even don't believe in that it. first part. You're trying to whitewash <laughs> with the part you don't care about. Anyways, they claimed it was a result of a vast conspiracy between Trump and Russia. Lest you think we're making it up, let's get in the DeLorean. Welcome back to Reliable Sources, uh, <laughs> where every day we're trying to keep track of the drip, drip, drip of the Russia investigations. Uh, the and it was not until we're after trying to keep the election track. that the extent of the Russian involvement in our presidential election really came to light. So you Director have Clapper. seen direct evidence of collusion? Uh, I don't want to go into specifics, but I will say that there <laughs> is evidence say, that yeah. is not circumstantial uh, and, uh, and is very much worthy of investigation. Listen, How's he in office? I don't want to get into specifics. Why is that? Namely, I don't have any. <laughs> Not, not uh, a single one. That is exactly uh, what he said. Pretty sure. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he did the Devil's Triangle in a, a rape gate gang ring. <laughs> so by the way, so out of this end up, we conducted an investigation, cost taxpayers, um, you and I, <laughs> good for us, $25 million. Oh, wow. Found yeah. 
there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Yeah. No, no criminal activity whatsoever. Uh, by the way, we also found out that some of the warrants were granted based on evidence presented from sources like the Steele dossier created by Fusion GPS. We've talked about that. A oh, Democrat yeah. research firm in Russia. <laughs> so that's kind of something that maybe we should look into. Yeah, um, and I will say this. In 2018, maybe we could have still called this a hoax. Yeah. Um, or, or maybe it would have been unfair, I guess, to, to call it a hoax but because we were still investigating. But, but now we know it was a false claim based on false evidence. Yeah. Proven false after two years, $25 million. I mean, that's as, that's as thoroughly debunked as a hoax can get. Cool. All of this, Hillary Clinton, uh, she still claims the election <laughs> is stolen. As I've been telling candidates who have come to see me, you can run the best campaign, you can even become the nominee, and you can have the election stolen from you. Or lose! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost like she's talking about herself there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, Hillary, that seems yeah. like a really neat motivational speech. Very specific. How many of us would that apply to? This one's more, that one was more for me. Yeah. And of course, autobiography. of course, Democrats are calling for more investigations. Yeah. Which is, this is where I think it's gone from hoax to conspiracy theory. Uh, and it's, this, this occurs with almost all conspiracy theories. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you disprove the conspiracy. They believe it even more yes. after yeah. you provide them with research. You see it with Trump and the Russians. Uh, if we didn't land on the moon. Vaccines cause what? autism. Or Brett Kavanaugh ran rape, gape gang, and the devil triangle <laughs> underground. The point is, Almost. it doesn't matter if you present it. It's like, hold on, there's complete evidence that's not the case. <laughs> or do they want you to believe that there's evidence that it's not the case? Uh, what? Uh, uh, <laughs> about the Russians? Oh NASA? But I repeat myself. Mm. What? <laughs> Wait, what? What's happening? Also, if the uh, Earth were rotating, if you oh, went up in a helicopter and you went up it, you went mm -hmm, up mm -hmm. for, and you were in Cameroon, you would land in Schenectady. What? <laughs> I mean, have you been to Antarctica? I, I, By the way, I want all those people to move to Canada. Hit Please. the notification uh, bell. They won't do that because they don't believe it exists. Uh, <laughs> fall off the edge of the Earth with a wild link. Bookmark the page because apparently notifications don't necessarily work. Join Mug Club and, uh, of course, subscribe on iTunes for some exclusive yeah. content there. Yeah. Hoax number three in 2019. Again, this is all the same. I know people are going to think I'm scraping. No, this was really easy. Yeah, very, very easy. Jesse oh. Smollett hate hopes. Oh. That seems. Oh. Kind of... oh. So what did he claim? Best actor. For people who forget <laughs> the absurdity of it, and this is important to go back, I, I think, and look at the time capsule, yeah. kind of like when you have your 20-year high school reunion, because we need to remember what it is that everyone believed at that moment in time. Uh, freezing Chicago night, two mass Trump supporters said this is MAGA country before they tried to strangle him and pour bleach on him. The attackers? It's the is attackers, it... but it's also the attacks. <laughs> it's like, you know, at first it was a thing of like, listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm. What? Mm -hmm. oh, see, the truth then it became a thing of like, oh, mm. how can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you uh, not believe that? Let me take a it's wild guess. <laughs> and then it became a thing of like, oh, Ooh, a thing of like. it's not necessarily that you don't believe that this is the truth. No. You don't even want to see. How many times have you said the truth? The truth. No, it's it's that we don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the only part you got wrong is the truth. It's we don't believe you. Oh my god. It gosh. is the truth. And then yeah. how can somebody like but then you realize that's because it is the truth. How many times did you say truth? You're like you're like Destiny's child who rhymed <laughs> down like that with down like that five times. <laughs> Oh my gosh. gosh. That By sucks. the way, in case, again, we, we now know the two Nigerian brothers worked on the show Empire, purchased the materials using the attack, yeah. Jesse paid them. We have the checks. We have the stuff that he paid them with. That's not just like, the first time in history paid by checks. Again, just in case you don't believe me, here's a video of them purchasing what what item? Everything. Everything for the hate crime. Look at that. Oh, that's. that's oh. Looks like. Yep, masks. Yeah. Hat. Camouflage. Masks shorts. and noose and a bottle of Clorox. Boys will be boys. It's <laughs> <laughs> a Saturday Clorox night. It is a Saturday anyway. night. Yeah. Everybody buys those things. So yeah. this is important because the DA found Smollett <laughs> guilty of fabricating the hoax. Yes. Uh, hopes, hoax. What is it with my I, my mouth Hops! isn't working? Mm. Uh, refuse to send some to anything but 16 hours of community service. That's a lot. And and this is one oh, of those man. things. And this is one of those situations people will look back in history, kind of like with OJ. And I'm not saying he's like OJ. Just as unlikable. <laughs> but they'll look back in history and say, how did that guy get away with it? And that's what's so corrosive with these hoaxes, because it received wall-to-wall -wall coverage from the leftist yeah. media yeah. who really wanted this to be a hate crime by MAGA hat wearing racists. They really wanted that to be a case. When it fell apart, they're not going to be the ones left with eggs on their face. What, they're going to admit they're wrong or that Kavanaugh isn't a gang rapist? What do you expect <laughs> yeah, well, from us? Hoax number two. We're, get, we're getting very near the end of this. Uh, the Covington oh kids, the hate hoax. Remember the kids wearing MAGA hats? They Those supposed, but originally, again, time capsule. <gasps> oh, look, lies. 
Everywhere. <laughs> they supposedly set, uh, they surrounded a poor Native American, poor um, Indian, who uh, they were trying <laughs> hey, Mark to an indigenous God. people's march. <laughs> and apparently this kid right, surrounded yeah. this, this, um, this uh, w w what's the term we use? Redskin. Redskin. Uh, shouting, <laughs> build Jeez. that wall. This was the coverage. Catholic high school students, seen wearing Make America Great Again hats, appearing to face off with Nathan Phillips, a 65-year-old Native American, as he passed wow. the drum near the Lincoln Memorial during an Indigenous People's March. I heard them saying, build that wall, build that wall. You know, this is Indigenous lands. Uh, no. We're not supposed to have walls here. We never did. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess if, he's, if, he cl if the toothless meth head claims he heard it. <laughs> <laughs> it must be true. Good enough for me. This is reliable sources, after all. <laughs> Mr. Toothless Meth Head, did you hear them yell out racial epithets? <laughs> yes, I believe that I did. <laughs> Good enough for me. Don Lemon, you're next. Accurate source. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. What actually happened? Students oh, were man. waiting for their ride, and they were being harassed by black Israelites for an hour. And then Nathan, uh, Nathan Phillips decided to pile on. It turns hey, out well. that he approached the students, banging his drum in their faces. Here we no. have some video. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. He's I walking. Right. Here yeah. come Gad. Here come Gad. What's that guy yelling? I don't know what that means. Dad? Here yeah. come Dad. Well, it, listen, it makes more sense when you're saying that Nathan Phillips is a deranged, deranged activist who he, he does this all the time. After the Covington kids controversy, um, he tried to storm a Catholic church in the middle of mass, begging yeah. his drum. Oh, boy. Yeah. Students of Covington Catholic High School be reprimanded, not just by the school. Not a charismatic guy. <laughs> but by their upcoming universities. Uh, we show the Catholic maybe another church one. how to respect prayer, how to respect ceremony. It is not what? even their land. Huh? Help them Can someone please take his drum and put his head <laughs> through it so he wears it like a necklace? It's, <laughs> it's not a real call to violence, by the way, because it's just cartoonish. It wouldn't hurt at all. It's just like, boom, <laughs> duh, boss. That's what I want to see. <laughs> you know, I always find it funny that he's talking about his land and he's yeah. on the iPhone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the white my, my man forces me to live is... this way. Really? I don't but think you have so. That, I mean, that's the updated Android. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like things aren't out. that bad for you. Mm. If I don't update it, they throttle my battery. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's enough time. Uh, 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 final one. It's because five is a magic number on YouTube, so we, but oh, there, there we you could go. have done 20. Uh, there are a bunch of smaller hate crimes. Hoax number one is just a whole bunch of them because five wasn't enough. So there's like this, this example was a uh, fake anti-Semitic uh, attack on a Jewish restaurant in Canada. This got wall-to-wall -wall coverage. The Jewish communities in Canada are still trying to make sense of an alleged fake anti-Semitic attack in Winnipeg. Whoops. Police say the owners of a family restaurant mm. staged everything, but the family insists that they're telling the truth. Did you fake the vandalism we around this We didn't. We didn't. Because we don't joke about swastika on our walls. One of the owners said she was assaulted. <laughs> <laughs> Those are terrifying. But after investigating, police charged three members of the family either. with public mischief. Imagine an episode of Lock Up with a swastika narwhal. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the, he's got the uh, Edward Norton American history. Yeah, <laughs> this means not welcome. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was fake, by the way. And there were a bunch uh, of fake LGBT uh, hate crimes in Portland. Uh, the reporter Andy Andy go uh and and go and go and not going to be featured on this show anymore <laughs> he researched a bunch of these reports in a supposed wave of uh, hate crimes you've heard about this a lot right yeah. this is why it's important because the narrative has been set by this wave the surge in hate crimes. it's everywhere they found this investigation found that they almost all uh fit the pattern of being highly publicized despite having no evidence ultimately leading <laughs> to no police investigation <laughs> so why are these number one That's a bad look yeah. Instead of a bigger profile hoax. And that's because these smaller hoaxes, they actually push the narrative more than the big ones. Yes. Because fewer people know that they're hoaxes. Media reports on them at one point or another. And then they turn out to be false because these aren't as high profile of case. People just, they don't hear about it. They no. never knew yeah. that it was a no. hoax. They all they remember was the original. Just like you have many people, by the way, who still believe Kavanaugh uh, to be a rapist. But not as many because there have been enough people like us who've been at the forefront of that. The media indicts. The media is very quick to indict. Yeah. They, they don't vindicate. Okay, by the time vindication or truth emerges, they've moved on. They're super fast to indict, slow to correct or vindicate, if ever. Yeah. We're at a point where leftists, they openly push hoaxes on CNN, MSNBC, New York Times. It's not people at the fringe. That's what's important. We have yep, senators, yeah. congressmen, presidential candidates pushing hoaxes that have been conclusively 
disproven, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, then these people have the nerve, this is what really bothers me, the nerve to bemoan today's political polarization. <laughs> I've right. said this so yeah. many times and I stand by it. I have no problem with political polarization if its net effect is that of truth. Yeah. What's, what's virtuous about being moderate in the face of someone's life being turned to ruins by lies? Let me ask you this, okay, let's say you're up for a job, a uh, big promotion yeah. at your job, okay? Three women come forward and accuse you of running rape gangs, which has zero basis in truth. If you don't go along with it, if you fight it with every fiber of your being, are you guilty of contributing to the office polarized climate? Yeah. What if it was your kids who were accused of a hate crime? And if yeah. you don't passionately fight back, their, their names, their reputations, ability to make future livings, they'll be ruined for the rest of their lives. Yeah. It's the, called obstruction. Right. It's obstruction. Is, is, is the, is the G, G. Willikers, let's listen to both sides, milk toast pansy, more virtuous than the person who fights back. And I'm not, this is the thing, I'm not going to play this game with the left because like you see with these hoaxes, they're only going to get worse. And then when disproven, they move on. You, you don't get to lie and then defame the person fighting that lie right. for polarizing America. Yeah. So this is something I think everyone out there needs to decide. You have to take inventory of how you've reacted to these stories, okay? And ask yourself a question, what's more desirable? A lie that brings people together at the cost of destroying everything, but particularly an innocent person, mm -hmm. or the responding truth that sows division? Might be a tough one for you. For me, it's pretty easy. Hey there, if you like this video, subscribe, or click one of these videos playing in a box. You know what? hit the notification bell because subscriptions don't really mean anything anymore, especially if you're not 18 or older, at the very least logged into YouTube as 18 or older, because sometimes people are 25, but they don't know how to use the YouTube system properly. And then you never just hit the notification bell or you hate yourself. Well, comedian and podcast host Adam Carolla is one of the most stalwart defenders of actual free speech left in America. Carolla is not only a famous host, he's, he's an amazing car racing fan and participant. We were just in L.A. last week, and we decided to go over to his race car garage and talk to him because we couldn't resist because it's amazing. Here's part of the conversation that resulted. Adam Carolla, you've been on the road for the past several months talking about free speech. I know your views on it. Have you been able to convince the audience, especially young people, that free speech matters? Are they on your side, do you think? Uh, I've been able to convince my audience who already thought <laughs> free speech mattered. Uh, I think people, I think the pendulum is starting to swing back a little bit, you know? We've had, hit a saturation level. Um, I sort of believe as human beings we work this way. Like, I believe that in the late 80s, there were hair bands and big guys wearing, you know, bouffants and spandex and aquanet and eyeliner and everything else. And then that gave way to grunge music. Yeah. Kurt Cobain, tattered shirts, nobody cared, right? So it's like, what could be further away from hair bands, grunge music? And that's what came next. So I'm starting to wonder if it's swinging back. I think the insanity of the woke folks out there have forced sane people to push back, and we may be going from the hair band to the grunge movement. Have the woke people pushed back against you? Yeah, the woke people are, they'll push back against anybody at any But time. you don't seem bothered. You're, you're like the one person I know who seems totally uninterested in what the woke people say and totally unbothered by their attacks. Well, I know what's in my heart, and I hate that statement, but I know who I am. You can't convince me I hate a group, hate a sexual proclivity, hate a person. You couldn't convince me I hated a neighbor or a friend or Hispanics, blacks, gays, whatever. You can't bestow that upon me. That's something that's inside me, and I'm aware of it, and I know I don't. So you can't convince me of that. So you're not afraid because you know what they're saying is a lie. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm an atheist. Like, I really don't care. Like, at the end of the day, I want to go race one of these cars and wrench on something and build something and eat dinner with my kids and wife. Like, I, I, there's a sort of freedom in, in not caring. There's a real freedom in not caring. Huh. Why don't more people feel that way? I think there's a vanity, and I, and I think that everybody is, is wired to be a little bit narcissistic, and no one wants to go online and read bad things about themselves, right. and nobody wants to read untruths or inaccurate things about themselves. And so we are wired 
to alleviate. So I, I, I've never thought about it this way, but here you go. When your ankle is sore, you're wired to stay off your ankle, like less weight, hop, yes. hop, lean this way. You go on Twitter, you read a bunch of horrible things about yourself, you're wired to alleviate. You're not wired to put weight on a rolled ankle, you're wired to go, oh, people are saying X, Y, and Z about me on Twitter, let's fix that. Right. And, and the fix is apologizing and walking statements back, but to get it to go away, I wanna alleviate. I'm not interested in the truth, I'm not interested in, what the history books say, I, I want this, my ankle hurts. I want to get the weight off it immediately. So you walking this stuff back, you apologizing, you kowtowing to these people is a way to get the weight. It's like a crutch and I can get the right. weight off this and it'll go away and I don't care about what the doctor or the orthopedic it surgeon thinks. It just like hurts. Right make, now, make the pain it hurts. Yeah. I want it to go away. <laughs> but you don't play that game and therefore they don't bother you. And it just seems like that's a model for the rest of us, that if everybody had that attitude, like, I don't care, I just want to wrench on my cars and have dinner with my kids, they well, would have no power. They're not in the business of banging their head against a wall. They're in the business of mowing you down and moving on to their next subject. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're immediate gratification group. Let's remember, these were kids who got everything they wanted immediately. Right. So if you don't give them immediate <laughs> gratification, they're off you in like two days. Yeah, no. They, they, this is not, you know, a long slog that's gonna take place over months and years. This is, you give me what I want right now, which is an apology, or to you to get fired from your job, or whatever that is, you to be humiliated, and you to be contrite, and if you don't give in almost immediately, they immediately move on to their next Well, then victim. you'd have to be a moron to give in immediately to unreasonable demands, wouldn't you? I think so, but you know, you would think about all the politicians and all the newscasters and, and voices out there. You think about the ones that just sort of weathered the storm and just put their head down and said no apology. They immediately pack up and go find another victim or somebody to turn into a victim. And if it's clear that there's nothing here for you, if they ring you like a bar rag and no tears come out, <laughs> they move on because they want a bucket of tears. <laughs> they want a bucket of your tears and they ring and they ring and you just go, don't let a drop fall. Oh. And if the drop doesn't hit that pail, they pick up the pail and they go, let's go find some more tears. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you.